Dog Works Radio is sponsored by Alaska Dog Works. Check out their website at alaskadogworks.com. You can support this podcast on patreon.com forward slash first paw media. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by First Paw Coffee Company, specializing in private label premium blend coffee. If you're serious about coffee, you should check it out. First Paw Coffee's passion is high quality, small batch roasted coffee. They take the extra time to taste and get everything perfect before they release new blends. They aim to bring you a cup of happiness each time you pour yourself some coffee. Find out more at ak.dog slash free and enter for a chance to win some First Paw Coffee prizes, a book from our collection and tote bag. One winner will be selected at random each month. That's ak.dog slash free. Radio Free Palmer 89.5 KVRF presents Mushing Radio, hosted by Robert Forto. Mushing Radio is about dog-powered sports, living in the Great White North, and mushing. Visit our website at mushingradio.com. Here is your host, Robert Forto. Hello and welcome everybody. This is Robert Forto and you're listening to Mushing Radio here on KVRF 89.7 in the Matsu Valley. RadioFreePalmer.org is our live streaming site and you can find all of our episodes over on DogWorksRadio.com. Be sure to check us out on social media at DogWorks Radio and hit that subscribe button wherever you are listening to this podcast and do us a favor and tell your family and friends about it too. So today we have a very cool guest coming on. He is the writer and director of a new sled dog movie. His name is Bobby Anderson and he is calling in from Los Angeles, California. Bobby, how's it going today? It's going great. I'm so excited to be on and talk about this project with you guys. Well, thank you very much. The project is called Heart Prints in the Snow, and I'm looking forward to really diving in and talking about the film. Uh, I, w- I had uh, the chance to, to watch it uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, you know, as a musher, it really, uh, really pulled at the heartstrings for sure for me. But before we jump into that, Bobby, can you give us a little bit of background, tell us who you are, what you're all about, and uh, maybe a little bit of a lead up into uh, to how you got started in this project? Yeah, so, um, well, as you mentioned, I currently live in L.A., but I never thought I'd end up here. (laughs) Um, I'm originally from Flint, Michigan, and we, as a family, we decided to get a um, a dog, and we settled on an Alaskan Malamute, and anybody that knows anything about those Alaskan breeds, the Swiss breeds, they have a lot of energy. So we were thinking, how do we get the energy, you know, out of this dog in a healthy way? And we actually connected with Mid-Union Sled Haulers, which is a mustering organization out of Michigan, very active, um, very pro-animal, very respectful, um, more amateur uh, racers. And we went to our first event. We did a one dog. And then from that, we got more dogs, had a litter of pups. We had up to 16 dogs. And it just snowballed into all these different events and outreach and education and I mean, I don't think anybody in my family ever intended on getting started in mushing. It just kind of found us. And when you have these kinds of dogs, whether it's Alaskan Husky, Siberian Husky, Alaskan Malamute, um, it's it's really healthy and it's great to engage them in a sport that you can both enjoy. So since, you know, I went to college, our dogs unfortunately had passed away. So it's been about 10 to 11 years. And I was watching Call of the Wild, the new one with Harrison Ford. And I'm sitting with my friend, and about every 10 minutes, I keep crying. And it's, it's, it's kind of embarrassing, but at the same time, like, there's just something about the bonds between man and dog that just, it just gets to you, especially when you've gone through the sport for so long. And it was in that moment that I realized I meant to make a project about that. Because there's so many movies. There's, you know, Call of the Wild, which has been done many different times. There are other documentaries about historical events, especially with the Iditarod or the Serum Run. Um, And I haven't seen a movie made that just focuses on the bond between dogs and, or dog teams and the mushers. Um, And so that's kind of snowballed into this project. And I'm just very thankful to getting the response I've been getting because all I wanted to do was to create a positive movie that shows the sport in a positive way because you can't have a successful team 
if you're not operating as if it's a family unit. You know, everyone has their role, but the respect and the love is there. And I really wanted to bring that to the screen. There is a lot to unpack there, and I, I hope we can uh, touch, touch, <laughs> <I know. laughs> on, touch on some of those points for sure. Bobby, so you, in the film, you mentioned that uh, you're in L.A., you're, you're an actor, but you're also uh, a, now a director and all of that. With this project, how did you find your way to California? What's the story with that? Well, growing up, um, I think I actually started when I was in eighth grade. I always had a love of the art. I mean, I have been playing music and writing music since fifth grade. And combining that with dog sledding, was, it's, it's, they're, very, they're very different, right? Yes. And when I got into college and I realized that in the arts is where I wanted to go, I, I realized I really had two options. At the time, it's you go to L.A. or you go to New York. Right. And I tried the New York thing. It really wasn't my bag. So I'm like, I'm going to try Los Angeles. And I was a little scared because most people always told me that's where all the danger is, but it, it couldn't be further from the truth. I love this city. There's a lot of great culture. It's very diverse. Um, but yeah, I, I just, one thing led to another. And when you're in the arts, you kind of pick one or two areas. Some people go to Vegas, but it brought me to LA. And if I hadn't have come here, I wouldn't have been able to make my own projects and get into the film industry. And this project never would have happened. So it, it's really just the love of the arts and wanting to be an actor. And that's what, drove me out here when I was 19. Very interesting. So when you say um, uh, being an actor, I love uh, sort of uh, behind the scenes or nuts and bolts parts of, of uh, stories. Are you involved in television, TV, uh, commercials? What, what, uh, what do you gravitate towards or is it just anything that, uh, that comes up? So definitely television. I thought that I would be more focused on film. Um, but the way the cards fell, it just ended up being with television. I was able to book um, a guest star on Glow uh, on Netflix on season three. There was a new series on Lifetime called American Princess about um, a renaissance fair. It was really quirky, made by the same people that did Orange is the New Black. And um, it only was picked up for one season, but I played Sean on that series. And then I've also done some documentary, like docudrama type stuff. So the recreation work, um, we did a true story about the Titanic and one coming out later this year. Um, about the Zodiac Killer, and it's, it's I've been very fortunate and very blessed, and I and I always thought that I was just going to do film. I was going to make an hour and a half feature in every project. For the most part, has been television, and I'm not complaining because it's expensive to live out here, and I'm happy for the paycheck, <laughs> and I get to do what I love to do every day. So it's been a blessing. Very cool. I, I look forward to to seeing you sometime on, on uh, one of these uh, one of these shows. I'll definitely watch your name in the credits for sure. So, Bobby, let's jump into this project. Uh, as you said, it, it's really a family affair. It's what it's all about. And anybody that's involved with mushing, they will tell you it is truly uh, a family affair. It, it takes it takes a, a village to to make sure that. Um, you can get down the trail, whether it's just helping feed and uh, take care of the dogs at home or on the road with, uh, you know, handling at races and making sure everybody gets to the start line and all of that. In the film, mm -hmm. your your family uh, plays heavily in it. Uh, I believe it's your your sister and your mom and dad are, are the sort of the main characters of the first part of the film. And they talk about right. that story with uh, with your Malamutes and you know, some of the, um, some of the races you did, of course, uh, some of the stories about the dogs. Uh, I, I guess my first question to you, Bobby, is how did you guys get involved with the Malamute compared to other sled dogs? Was it, um, a family friend that had one or what? Well, again, we never even intended on getting into mushing. I think that we had a dog, um, he was a mixed breed, wasn't even sure what he was. His name was Bear amazing animal when he passed away we were looking at when we were ready of course to get another dog and my dad loved malamute mainly because you know especially my dad you know being from the midwest he likes that strong um like very manly muscular type animal um and very family friendly too i mean it's it's an amazing breed and so when he got our malamute we had books you know, we try to learn everything we can about the breed because we want to make sure we can give the breed what it needs. We don't want to just get a dog and not know how to raise him or how to care for him properly. And we kept seeing things about dog sledding. And, you know, yeah, opportunities came up where we could have 
had Siberian Huskies or a Samoyed or an Alaskan Husky, but there's just this aspect about Alaskan Malamutes that, as my dad says in the movie, encompassed everything that he as a man would want in a dog. And not only as a man, but also for a family, because those dogs were treated like they were our brothers and sisters. Like, in, in it, I, I would not have picked any other dog. I love all the breeds. But I'm so thankful that we stuck with Alaskan Malamutes. Plus, my dad likes to do longer distance, and Malamutes, I think, are more suited for that um, because they're a little bit more, um, they're a little stockier, a little more muscular. Um, he didn't, he wasn't looking at sprint racing, anything like that, and we were more involved. So the Malamutes were the perfect option. Yeah, they're great dogs for sure. I think we have one in, in the house right now for for training. We're we're dog trainers, and and we have one uh-huh. right in the in the back of the yard for sure. So in the story, uh, your sister talks about being a little bit more competitive than than your dad. She really enjoyed racing and uh, really took to that side of it. Where did you fit in in this uh, family dynamic? Were you involved with sort of the behind the scenes stuff? Were you involved with racing or, or what was your role in the family? So I, being the youngest, um, a lot of it was spent growing up, at least when I was, what, six years old when I got involved and my sister's two years older than me. So my dad was primarily the racer and then my sister got involved when she was 10. Because um, this group, usually once you're 10 years old is when you would start. Um, just so you have enough time to, you know, get strength together. Cause it, it's a lot of activity to, to run a dog team. So right. they want to make sure that you're ready for it. Um, and so I started out as just a handler. And then I just kind of fell into that role because, um, the dogs at that point were very acclimated to my father and my sister's team. And again, she was more competitive. And if you want, I can get into more of like her dogs as well and how she fell into that. Um, but she was a very competitive and those dogs really responded well to her. So I would take the dogs out for a run here and there. But I did a lot more of the grunt work, like getting the dogs harnessed, getting the dogs ready to go to the start line. We'd feed dogs every morning, making salmon water, you know, a lot of cleanup, um, even de-shedding every year. Like it was more of hands-on and they kind of took it out. Almost like when you have a race car, you have the driver that goes around the track. And I was somebody that when they had to make a pit stop, we take everything, we take care of it so that they can continue to go. So my dad and my sister were definitely more of the mushers and me and my mother were more of the handlers. And I mean, I, I still loved it and I had my opportunities to go out and run and it was more fun being a handler. I think because everybody had a role and it it united the family. We weren't all trying to be in the muster. We weren't all trying to race. We all fell in line and it was cohesive and it worked really well. Yeah, Bobby, I tell folks all the time, it's, it is it is very similar to NASCAR. You have to have a very successful pit crew in order to mm-hmm. have a uh, a good race car or a good race. And it's, it's similar in music as well. You have to have good guitar techs and drum techs and sound operators in order to have a good sounding band. So the handlers mm-hmm. and the uh, quote unquote pit crew are very important parts of that also in the movie you have a, a a sequence where you guys are involved with the um with the event at the super bowl when it was in detroit several years ago can you tell us a little bit about yeah. that experience that was amazing so i never thought and i don't think most people would think that you would find dog sleds just running through the streets of downtown detroit um it was when the super bowl came in i believe it was 2005 and we were contacted by someone who was creating this winter festival, Motown Winter Blast, because they were trying to highlight different parts of Michigan, because there's a lot of tourism coming into that area to watch the Super Bowl from all over the country. And like we have this, these great dog sledding groups. Let's bring some of the mushers that we trust, that we know will have teams that can handle it. Let's bring them and have them do tours. And they gave us a smaller track. It was, I mean, maybe half the size of uh, like a high school track that you'd kind of run around. So that posed its own challenges because you have dogs used to running on a trail. And now you're asking them to, with all these people and spectators taking pictures and there's music going and all these distractions and smells and just normal city life still going on. Now we're going to ask you to do this perfect circular track. I mean, it took so much, I guess, um, listening and, and trust between the people and their dogs because that would never have worked if the dogs didn't trust the musher and the musher didn't trust the dogs. And that's, again, where it all, all comes down to the foundation of how you train your animals. 
And it was great. We gave, um, at the time, Governor Granholm, she got a ride. We gave a ride to Mia Hamm, the famous soccer player. Um, all of them were just in awe of how this even happened. Because they would say, my dog would never do this. How does your dog so focused? And it's because as mushers, you learn the value of your dogs. You learn the value of the relationship. And when you have that relationship, you can both work cohesively. So it was it was a great experience, and the dogs listened well. We had tons of people coming up and petting them and learning about the sport, and that's the biggest thing. The only reason we really try to do these events is for education, because there is a lot of negative stigma, especially nowadays, about the sport, and it's important to remember how the sport works and how there's so much love that goes into it and the bonds that you form with your dogs. And unless you're a musher, or unless you're really involved in the sport, I'm not sure you quite understand it, but we felt an obligation to show the world how it works and show the world, especially those in this event in Detroit, just how special this sport is. And we were able to change a lot of minds. We were able to really showcase the sport in a positive light. And because of that, it's probably one of the best experiences that my family had because we showed that message out to thousands and thousands of people. It was, it was magical, to be honest. I know that might sound cliche, but it was a very magical experience. I agree with you, Bobby. And I think that that's sort of a plot synopsis of the entire film in that event. Uh, not only does it show the, the care and compassion that you guys, and of course, you guys meaning everybody that was involved in the event, but also that bond that you guys have. And then, of course, that's a, a huge takeaway for anybody that's attending that event, just as a spectator or a writer or whatever they're doing, because they see that bond and that trust in their own dog when they go home. And, and they they relish those stories and, and those experiences. And I think that that's exactly the, the message that you're trying to promote in your film, is that connection that we have with these amazing dogs, whether it's the the sled dogs or the uh, the uh, couch potato dog that's that's laying on the couch while you're watching Netflix, right? And and what the biggest takeaway for me, and this isn't even just that Motown Winter Blast event, but we would do in school demos, we would do other events just for outreach. And the biggest thing, or I would say the number one thing that we hear back from people is, I had no idea that you didn't like use like whips. Or things you think, you know, the stereotypical, not trying to call down Hollywood or anything, but you have those characters in the movies where they're, you know, trying to get the sled to go and they bring out their whip and they, they crack it and scares the dogs. So that is banned from mid-union sled haulers. We don't do that. And the fact that people were saying, I had no idea this is how it works. If your dogs really listen to you. This is amazing. The dogs love it. And my, my response is always, yeah, if you have dogs out on a line, if you even show up to a dog sledding event, I'm, I'm sure anywhere in the nation, probably, and you bring out one harness, those dogs are going crazy because they want to run. If a dog didn't want to run, we don't make the dog run. It, we do it because they enjoy it. It's great exercise. We love doing it with them. And through that sport together, I have never formed a stronger bond with an animal than dogs that I had while we were mushing. Because it was a, it was a unit. We worked together. And since they were old enough to be trained several months in, to when they unfortunately passed away and maybe they weren't running anymore. We have, it, it's, the bond is so strong. And again, coming back full circle, that's why I made the movie because I saw how many minds we could change at the time. And it's been a decade since I've been able to do that. And I feel kind of an obligation now that I do create my own content. I make my own films and I'm also acting and getting a platform. I now have a way to change more minds because that negative, press I feel like especially out of Michigan isn't necessarily going down so I'm like well I'm going to do what I can to show the world that mushers and their dog team it's a it's, it's a very loving experience so yeah well I, I applaud you becoming an, an ambassador for that uh, that's a very important part of our outreach and, and that's one of the main reasons why I wanted to have you on the show for sure Bobby so in the movie you have several other uh, characters uh, that that you portray uh, that are involved in, in the sport in one aspect or another. And by the time this airs, uh, we, have, we will have aired our interview with Destiny Keel, who grew up in mm -hmm. Lushing, very similar to you. I'm very familiar with her 
grandfather, Jerry, who also lives in Michigan, and she works yeah. with rescue dogs. And if we could just touch on that for just a second, I don't want to run out of time here, but what what is the aspect of, of, of rescues with mushing? Because that's a, a pretty big uh, component uh, where people rescue dogs from shelters or other kennels or whatever and build a team that way. It's very common, isn't it? It, it is, and it's more common than people think. And I've seen dogs, not even just rescue dogs that are the traditional dog sled breeds, but we've seen, I mean, in Mush, which when I was younger, you know, you have this tainted idea of what a dog sled dog is. And we would see German Shepherds. We've seen, like, Golden Retriever Hybrids. And what's so special about it is you're getting these dogs um, that feel like everyone's given up on them. And they don't have that love and they don't have that, you know, family aspect. And you can just see it in their eyes so that they're just distressed. And then when you, when you start to raise them with your dog team, they realize, look at this huge family I have now. And it completely changes over time. You know, it, you do have to work with them a little bit to gain their trust. But they end up being so, like, I've heard so many stories where they were the best dog sled dogs they've had because of, them relearning to love and they realize that I had come from a bad situation and now I'm being presented with a huge family and not only that family but now here's this huge mushing organization and I'm out with the dogs we're sitting on their laps we're going for walks where we have all this area to run around and play and you completely change that dog's worldview and that's magical because I don't know personally how anybody anybody could ever be malicious to an animal I, I, I could never do that. I don't understand the mentality, and it, 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 it's sickening to me. But when you can take those dogs out of that environment and not just have them in a house with, like, maybe a kid and, and then a family, and that's great. And any, everybody should rescue. But when you're able to put them in an environment where they have a pack and they have, like, a huge family, that's, that does wonders for them. And so when I was interviewing Destiny and hearing her stories and what she's done, and she'll even say that her lead dog, ended up being the best sled dog she's ever had and she was a rescue and I think I believe her name was Chica was her lead dog and we had a dog Nikolai who was with a musher um, who was not I would not say he, he was very fair to his dog um, the dog ended up just giving up and said I don't want to run for you anymore and he was like well I don't you know I'm going to give him to the pound and my family's like no 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 we will take him he's like why would you want this dog he's not running anymore we're like we can tell this dog, just, just let us take him. So we took him. He became my sister's lead dog. And he outraced every other dog, even in amateur sports, to the point where this guy came back. He's like, oh, this dog's doing amazing. I, I'll, I'll buy him back from you. And we're like, absolutely not. Because the dog didn't have an issue. He was just mistreated. And then you put him into a situation where he's in a loving family in a pack, and he has owners that love him, and he was the best dog out there. It, it's it's, it's such a magical thing to see. So when you rescue animals and you give them a new perspective on life and you see that change in them, then you know you've, you've done a good deed. You know you've done your part and you've changed that animal's life. And that is another big thing, at least for us at the heart of mushing, is getting those dogs trust and having a family with them and loving them as you would your brother or your sister. Wow. For folks that are listening, I think uh, you can see why uh, a film like this is is important. Uh, what, what a message it holds. And I think we've touched on a bunch of those in our short time together. So, uh -huh. Bobby, I have just a couple of more questions before we end our show. And again, going a little bit behind the scenes, uh, you uh, say in the film that you had your struggles because of, uh, of the lockdown and pandemic and getting to your interviews and all of that. What was your biggest struggle in making this film? Was it uh, just being uh, in that lockdown state or did you have other big challenges as well? Um, as far as challenges, it really did come down to the pandemic. Uh, when I had announced, because uh, I was planning on using people from Mush, that I wanted to make this film. Initially, people that I didn't know personally, it has been a long time. And there's different people in the sport now. It kind of broke my heart because they thought anytime someone brings a documentary up, they instantly think it's going to be spun in a negative way. So they're very defensive. Right. And so it did take a little bit of, of um, 
persuasion and say, here's what my storyline is. This is what I want to do. And as soon as they knew that, I had so many people jumping on board. So I didn't have a problem with the casting aspect, getting those things figured out. I had plane tickets booked. I had all these places to go. And then when they really stopped the domestic travel, that was my biggest problem because I, sure, I could fly in to Michigan and go to this Mystic, uh, Mystic Lake race. The problem is I have to have a pass from the Michigan um, Department of Natural Resources to even go in. And because I'd be presenting an out-of-state license to get that pass, they wouldn't allow me in because I'm not allowed to be as an out-of-state resident, not only out-of-state, but also from the epicenter at the time, which was Los Angeles. So I had this dilemma of what do I do? Do I just focus on my family? Because I was able to go home and see them. That's no problem. But I can't see these races in person. So I just decided to get creative and shoot it cinematically, but using like a virtual interview. I didn't want to do just split screen, but then I'd have them, I'd, I'd you know, offer an incentive, a little extra money. Cause I tried to, you know, make it worth their time. They could buy the dog food, whatnot with that. I'm like, I'll, I'll pay for your footage. Like if you have any additional clips from races that you're there that I can include, that'll kind of curb that. But the biggest thing is I just had to make sure I was able to tell their story, whether it was virtual or in person. And we were able to do that. So it was a challenge. I'm still very happy with what we were able to accomplish because the message is still there. But we have plans, hopefully here in the coming year, to maybe go back and revisit it, do it in person, maybe make a mini series out of it. Because the story's not done. I mean, this is work, especially advocacy work. It doesn't just stop with a movie. You have to keep doing it. So if I'm able to change a few minds with this one, then it allows me to make the next version and the next version. Because I'm not done until I'm able to change as many minds as possible. And Bobby, that was my next question is what is next with this? Because, uh, you know, there are stories to be told. And I'm sure uh, as a filmmaker, you always are critiquing your own product and thinking, wow, I could have done this or could have done that. Uh, and it's, it's going to be interesting to see where that lies. Before we uh, talk about where we can see it and uh, how folks can follow you on social and, and on the web, I always ask my guests the same question. And since you have been involved with mushing since you were a little kid, I'm interested to hear your uh, your your answer to this. And that is, Bobby, if a person came up to you today and they're just now getting involved in the sport, whether they're going to do uh, you know just uh, recreational mushing or maybe one day do racing or Iditarod or whatever, if you could give them one piece of advice, what would that be? The biggest thing I think, especially when you're starting out is make sure you know at least the basics of what you want to do because education is very important. And a lot of people think because they see movies or they see, you know, they'll go be a spectator at a sport and they see how well these dogs do. They think I can just hook my dog up to a harness and I can get him to run. It's not that simple. So it's just make sure that you know the ins and outs of what mushing is, whether you want to maybe do winter racing or you want to do the training season, the dryland mushing. Just make sure you know, A, about the breed and what the breed needs and know about their how their coats work, know how their paws work, know how all of that is. Just like dance. I mean, you're not going to be a dancer and go get the world famous ballet the next day. You have to train. You have to make sure you're ready. You understand how your body works. So if you want to get into muffing, just make sure that you're ready for it and that you have at least studied enough about the sport and about the dogs you intend to run so that you can properly train them. Because there's a lot of improper training out there. And there's a lot of non people that, and it leads to, I don't want to say abuse, but they don't know what they're doing, so it's detrimental to the dog. But if you took the time to train and to learn, like we did, we got our Malamute, we had books, we talked to people, we went to a dog sledding organization, we kind of saw how things worked, and then we said, okay, now we're going to try it. We didn't just jump right in. So I think it's amazing people, if they have the dogs and they want to do this sport, again, I'm a huge advocate, but just make sure that you take the time to learn about it first, so that you know what you're doing, at least on a basic level. That's great advice for sure. So Bobby, how can, before we jump over to you, how can folks follow the film? Where can they watch it? Uh, do you have a, a Facebook page? Let's talk about the film first, and then we'll talk about you. Yeah, so right now, the film, we have our first premiere coming out. Um, it'll be through the Muskegon Channel, Channel 96 On Demand. So if you have a smart TV, all you need is the Roku app or Amazon Fire and just search Muskegon Channel. You can find it there for free. 
So you don't have to worry about paying for it. And that'll be like the first streaming site. Um, also, if you're curious about updates about where we're going forward, we do have an Instagram and a Facebook page. Our Facebook page, just search Heart Prints in the Snow and you'll find it. It'll be like the logo with our dog. You'll see, you'll see our poster on there. And then on Instagram, it's just um, Heart Prints Movie, just one word. And you can find all those updates too. We do have options if you prefer to have a DVD copy. We are selling it on DVD. You can find it on those uh, two platforms. Um, but again, if you'd rather watch it for free, just tune in on your smart TV to Roku or Amazon Fire, search Channel 96 or the Muskegon Channel, and you'll find it. Um, but we're going to be posting a lot of updates, and all of these links will all be on our Facebook and Instagram pages. So if you can't remember, just log into those two pages, and you'll be updated with everything. And how can folks follow you, Bobby? Are you active on all the channels as well? Yeah, yeah. So if you go through our social media pages, there's a link for me, um, especially my company, Deepak Entertainment. Ironically, it's the name of our dog sledding uh, kennel name, Deepak, G meaning right, pack, the right pack to be with. Um, it's kind of, I decided to tie that into my production company. So you'll find Deepak Entertainment. that has all my information. You can also search for me and my, um, for the Actors Union, people don't realize you have to choose a fictitious name if your name's already taken, and mine was. So it's Robert Michael. Anything you want to search for me is Robert Michael, but please call me Bobby. So much more informal. Um, but yeah, on all those channels, you'll find me as well. Very good. Bobby, thank you very much for joining us today on this uh, episode of Mushing Radio. It's been a pleasure. I wish you well, and I uh, I hope that uh, we see part two, or, or whatever you're going to call it, of uh, Heart Prints in the Snow. I'm really excited to see that as well. But we'll definitely put all these links over on our show notes and uh, hopefully get some uh, folks to... Uh, to watch and, of course, uh, spread the message as well. Awesome. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of our guest today, this is Robert Forto for Mushing Radio. We will see you guys next time. Goodbye. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by First Paw Coffee Company. Learn more at firstpaw.coffee. From Dog Works Radio, this is Mushing Radio. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we invite you to subscribe in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll find a link on the episode notes. You can tap or swipe on the episode cover art, and you'll see some offers from our sponsors. You can support our show by supporting them. If you like what you have heard, we would love it if you could give us a five-star rating and tell your friends how to subscribe, too. Your hosts are Alex Stein and Robert Forto. Our producer is Robert Forto, created for Dog Works Radio.